Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome indeed to our worship service today at Central Schwenkfelder Church. We're glad that you have joined us virtually for this event, and we do trust that as uh, we are, have our minds and thoughts uh, come to the Father in heaven, that uh, our hearts will be blessed, and we're glad that you're participating with us this morning. We read these words as a call to worship uh, today from Hosea chapter 6, verse 3, this taking from uh, a Scottish paraphrase as found in the Scottish Psalter. Come, let us to the Lord our God with contrite hearts return. Our God is gracious, nor will leave the desolate to mourn. I don't know how this past week has been for you, whether it's been one of trial, one of testing, but God is gracious and he promises to meet us as we come to him and we come to him in worship, in sincerity, in truth. Let's start with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for this opportunity to worship. Will you please bless us now and come to us and refresh our souls as we think on things above and we think on your word. Bless us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen.
It's great to see you all again. Uh, you've never looked better. Our scripture for today is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 to 12. You can follow along with me at home. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee from these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith and take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you were made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's go to God in prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Walt and Roy Disney began the Disney Cartoon Studio in 1923. Almost a hundred years later, Disney is one of the biggest corporations in the entire world. Everybody knows Disney. They provide the country with adventure, with fun, and with fairy tales that end happily ever after. In Disney World, Disney World is the epitome of this where you can actually go and experience it. Disney World is this mythological place that, uh, that's full of fun and full of fantasy and that's looked upon as the gold standard of amusement. MVP of, of sports championship teams that just won championships like the Super Bowl. They get asked, what are you going to do now that you won the Super Bowl? I'm going to Disney World. Disney World, it's all about going to Disney and living that Disney life. Disney is, is very hyped, very hyped. Uh, my in-laws, bless their hearts, uh, my in-laws treated us and surprised us about a, a year ago with a trip to Disney World for the whole family. They saved for like 20 years to, to actually be able to do this. And I was excited to finally go to Disney World. Never been there before. It was one of my grandparents' biggest regrets that they were never able to bring our family to Disney World. And I'll tell you what. Disney World lived up to the hype. The park was immaculate. The employees called cast members. They were super courteous and friendly. And the attractions were, were all high quality and well done. And the rides, uh, I mean, just, just, just incredible. The nostalgia that you feel there. And we had a meal plan. We had a meal plan. All our meals were covered. And we got to eat at some of these extraordinary restaurants. The one place that we ate at, uh, we're dining in this place. It was like a, a drive-in movie theater. But it was indoors. 
Another place was uh, like a German festival that we were eating at. It was all indoors. And then another place was like I was eating in Nepal. Um, it was wild. And within the Magic Kingdom is the icon of Disney, the Cinderella Castle. It's right behind my family in this picture. The castle transforms at night during a huge light show. And Tinkerbell flies out the window and there's fireworks bursting everywhere. And the castle is functional too. Inside the castle is this luxury suite that is themed all around the story Cinderella. And the only way someone gets to stay in that suite is if they win a contest or if they're like a billionaire or something. And I dreamed about, I dreamed about how incredible it would be to live in Cinderella's castle with my family and have all access to Disney World all the time. And I would live happily ever after. Disney World is closed. We're quarantined on stay-at-home orders from the government. There are no sports. You can't even go out to eat at a restaurant. The church building is closed. The schools are closed. And moms and dads are teaching their kids from home. And you're either unemployed or working from home or working in danger's way. And there's a deadly contagion circulating. And no one can tell who may or may not have it or be carrying it. You can't visit with anyone outside your home, even family. And you've been like this for a month and a half. How are you responding to this way of life that's been imposed upon you? Some are doing well, and some of you are not doing so well. One thing I know for sure is that you have become raw and vulnerable perhaps more than you've ever been in your entire life. The hard dirt of who you had become is starting to become broken up. And you won't be the same person that you were before the COVID-19 outbreak. And so it's important to be conscious of, of what is being sown in the soil of your life, the aerated soil that you now have. In the Apostle Paul's first letter to Timothy, he encourages Timothy. And he, as Timothy oversees the church in Ephesus, Paul gives Timothy much needed direction to protect the vulnerable members of the church from false teaching and paints a picture of where they will find real contentment. So let's take a look at our scripture for today. 1 Timothy 6 3 to 12. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. See, guarding against false teachers is one of the main themes of this letter. People in the Ephesian church were being seduced by those coming to them speaking about mystical and, and Jewish and sensational prophecies, they taught things contrary to Jesus or manipulated the, the teachings of Jesus on purpose. Some deny God's word, some ignore it, and some explain it away. This was a problem for then, them then, but it's also a problem for you right now. Because you have false teachers in your life teaching different principles than that of Jesus, and they're vying for your devotion. Think about it. Politicians, media, including news agencies, uh, television stations, talk radio programming, uh, streaming sites, and then you have on social media, you have friends, celebrities, organizations, all trying to influence you, and the list goes on and on and on. You know, it's vital that you have a good grasp on Jesus' teaching and his gospel found in Scripture so that you can shield yourself from being influenced by these false teachers. 
He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. These false teachers were within and outside of the churches. Timothy and the people of the church needed to be on guard because these people were not always easy to identify because they can appear one way, but be something totally different. The fruit of what they grow is envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction. When these fruits surface, you need to question what you're involved in and who you are involved with. A cause or an ideology uh, may seem right, but it's shrouded in proclamations and exercises of godliness. You know, an extreme example of this would be, um, would be the Nazis who used Christianity and, and the church father Augustine's teachings uh, to influence support of persecuting the Jews. This is well documented at Holocaust museums. You see, false teachers see godliness as a means to get what they want, to push their agenda. You know, there's more subtle deceivers as well, such as those preaching the prosperity gospel. They fit right into this mold. And, and teaching that godliness, especially tithing, will make everything in your life great and, and, and will make you healthy and happy, that's not what Jesus taught. Jesus taught, deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. Matthew 6, 16. Paul goes on in the letter to truly enlighten, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Paul said those who misuse God's word and godliness do it as a means of material gain. But Paul exposes their foolishness and reveals where true prosperity is found. It's found in godliness through Jesus Christ which leads to contentment. The Greek word used here for content or contentment is autarkia, autarkia, which means a perfect condition of life in which no aid or support is needed. Autarkia is something that we all desire. Your whole life, you're itching. You're itching. You're itching to do something. You're itching to buy something. You're itching to earn something, to win something, to watch something, to experience something, to become something, to be stimulated, to escape, to go somewhere, to be with somebody, to be somebody, to get something, to get more, to get more, to get more and more and more. Itch, itch, itch. Squirm, squirm, squirm. These itches become magnified when you are in quarantine. It becomes more noticeable than ever that you're not content. That you're not truly content. Paul says that you have, if you have godliness in Christ, you have contentment which is great gain. With godliness through Christ, you can have as little as just food and clothes and still be content. Friends, I can't tell you where everything's going with COVID-19. But we all need to be prepared to do with little. If you're not content, 
If you were not content before this situation, are you content now? If you're not content now, will you be content with less? Many of you are familiar with Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which has been highly influential, especially in the world of psychology. And you can, you can see it right here. For some people, it looks like this, which explains the run on toilet paper during the pandemic. Let's get back to the original diagram. At the very foundation of the hierarchy is physiological needs, which include health, food, water, sleep, clothes, and shelter. Paul's saying that all we need is godliness through Christ and food, water, and clothes to be content. That's incredible because it renders the rest of Maslow's hierarchy and even the rest of his list of physiological needs as invalid. Or does it? Godliness in Christ includes trusting in Him and having a relationship with Him. Let's look at the next tier up. Safety. Godliness is trusting in God for safety and grasping onto Him during the storms and devastation of life, even torture and death as encountered by Christian martyrs. Christ's godly followers may not have complete security on earth, but they have complete eternal security, which provides a tremendous sense of peace, even in the face of the worst circumstances. Love and social belonging is the next tier. Believers have a very real friendship with Jesus. And the fellowship of believers become a family of love and intimacy. Some of you may be thinking, I'm not being realistic right now, that you can't be yourself around believers because they're a bunch of hypocrites eager to judge or neglect you. You know, this is a valid point. Many Christian communities have some people that create this dynamic. And it's sad. And it breaks my heart. But God, God does provide godly brothers and sisters who will love and accept you and bond with you. You just need to be patient. And you need to be willing to take risks with relationships. The next tier is self-esteem. You are someone who is created in God's image and then created uniquely by God for a purpose. You are so special that God sent His Son to die a horrible death on the cross to save you. Your body, your body is a temple for God, the temple of the Holy Spirit where God lives. God chooses to live in you. Godliness through Christ should supply plenty of self-esteem. The only problem is that self-esteem is deflated when you unfairly compare yourself to others. You always lose when you compare yourself. You also lose esteem if you sin and then bask in your shame instead of continuing to race, continuing to run the race that God's called you to. The next tier is self-actualization. This comes by living out your faith in Christ to its fullest and surrendering to His plan for your life. His plan may include a spouse and kids, or it might not. His plan for you may be to be a jet pilot. It may be to be a farmer, a computer technician, a laborer, a CEO, a CFO, a stay-at-home mom, a lawyer, a nurse, or a sanitation worker, or something else. To be truly self-actualized, you need to be Christ's disciple and continue His mission of reconciliation and restoration in this world 
no matter what your circumstance. Paul's letter to Timothy goes on. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. The desire to be rich is far more dangerous than riches themselves. And it's not just people who are poor or middle class that desire riches. People who are wealthy already can desire more wealth. Money is not a root of evil. The love of money is. The love of money causes people to do unethical and ungodly things. Things It overshadows the love of Christ and tempts your heart away from eternal riches. When the love of money comes upon you, it takes precedence over the well-being of your neighbor and over, the well, and over your love of God. It is through this craving, Paul says, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It is the fate of those who love money to never be satisfied, never be contented, never know what true riches are. You can be rich and not love money. There's nothing wrong with making money. God causes people to be successful, and sometimes making a lot of money follows along with that. Money blesses ministry, and it helps further God's mission. Paul expresses to wealthy believers to be generous and to help with this mission. But the love of money, the love of money, will lead to nothing but restlessness, disappointment, and emptiness. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Man of God refers specifically to Timothy, but it's also meant for all believers, including women, you know, women of God. If you find yourself tempted by the love of money, or by those who love money, or those using godliness to manipulate into something unchristlike, flee, run, get away from it, get away from them. Turn your eyes on God and grab hold of Him tight. And instead, pursue righteousness. Pursue godliness. Pursue faith. Pursue love, steadfastness, and gentleness. These are all things you should pursue while you're in quarantine with God by your side. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about, to wi and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight against the forces that are against you in this world and your own weak desire to want your happily ever after on this earth. It's not a fist fight against someone or a big argument. It's a fight against something that the world is trying to get you to do. It's a fight against your own desire to have that happily ever after right now. Right here in this life. That's what causes the love of money and other worldly things. Happily ever after. It comes to everyone who believes only to everyone who believes and confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who lived a sinless life and sacrificed himself on a cross for the remission of sin, and rose from the grave, defeating death, reconciling the world to himself. The real happily ever after is experienced when this body dies and you begin eternal life in heaven. Disney life may be great now and then here on earth. It may be a taste of things to come. But you will never be content with it. Even though it's quality, it's perishable. 
Only godliness through Christ will bring you contentment and you're happily ever after. Paul says in Philippians 3, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Nothing on earth comes even close to the riches of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Contentment. Yes, even contentment during a pandemic can be achieved here through Jesus Christ who paid for your happily ever after. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, help us to identify those false teachers in our lives. Father, draw us closer to Jesus and allow us to live a life of godliness with Him that we might receive contentment, that we may be satisfied. And Father, we thank You you most of all for Jesus Christ who, who paid for our happily ever after eternal life with you in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, knowing that godliness with contentment indeed is great gain. We will uh, pray for the world, then also for missionaries, and then also uh, for our own church and our own area. Please join me now in prayer. Our most great and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can find contentment in you and that you are the provider of every good and perfect gift. And we pray now that uh, as we bring these requests that are on our community's heart, that indeed you would give us peace and contentment deep in our souls. This past week, Lord, we have heard about uh, others in our world who are struggling in far greater ways than we are here in the States. We think of those uh, without homes who cannot shelter in home. We think of those without running water who cannot wash their hands. And we think of those who are unable to do social distancing to prevent the spread of this outbreak in their lands. And Lord, we pray for them. We especially pray for those countries that have been projected to have an increase in famine. And we think of those uh, lands uh, that might suffer great famine. And we pray to you today for those living in Yemen and in, Afga and in Afghanistan and in South Sudan and in Venezuela and in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in Ethiopia and Somalia. Lord, will you please be merciful to them? Will you please protect them? And Lord, will you please provide food in these regions of the world, we pray. We turn our thoughts to the mission field and thank you for missionaries who are faithfully serving in various lands. And we pray for them today. Lord, will you provide the support that they need financially? Will you keep them from danger, Lord, and protect them from those who might take their lives or the lives of those around them? Strengthen them, Lord, with the fact that uh, you are with all those who are faithful to you. Strengthen them, we pray. We turn our prayers now to uh, this area and to our church. And we think of those who are on the front lines responding to uh, the coronavirus. Lord, will you please be with first responders? Will you please protect them, look after them, and nurture them? We think of some within our congregation who indeed are working with as first responders. Please protect them and encourage them this day, we pray. We think of those uh, who have lost loved ones in our congregation and have felt a various sadness for a whole bunch of reasons. Lord, will you please be their comfort and their portion today. Strengthen them in their inner person and strengthen them with the fact that your comfort is always greater than what we can imagine or think. And then, Lord, we pray for our homes. And as we think of uh, uh, us all sheltering in place still, will you strengthen family life? Give us your encouragement, your presence, and the knowledge that we can find goodness in this world. Father, we do thank you that you are with us in all times. And we do pray that you would continue to have our focus be on godliness and contentment in you. Strengthen us throughout this week. And now, Lord, we conclude our prayer by taking upon our lips the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.